Uh, no, it's just part, part common. But then uh, the, the, the rest of it is common in, um, in form of question and difficulty of question. And uh, scheme for partial credit. Okay, so we have two chapters we're going to review today. Chapter 17, which was our more in-depth analysis of reflection of waves. And then chapter 18, which was our more in-depth analysis of refraction of waves. So in chapter 17, I mean, there's not all that much you can do with reflection, right? You can take light, reflect it off something, and that's pretty much it. Um, so we did have this single law of reflection, which was our basis for the entire chapter. So the law of reflection is that the angle of incidence equals the angle of reflection. And um, was that, and that's what? That's only true for plane mirrors, right? Wrong. That's true for everything. Mirrors, non-mirrors, right? Sidewalks, roads, um, everything, right? Law of reflection is always valid. However, we did have specular reflection off of smooth surfaces and diffuse reflection off of rough surfaces. So that's something we might want to take, take two minutes to review. Um, and then we do want to be able to describe the properties of images formed by plane mirrors, right? So if we have light from something, or I think, was it Jesse that we had? Try to see yourself in the mirror, if I remember incorrectly. Who was it? Oh, it was Alec. I think it was Alec. Right? So if Alex, uh, we're trying to see Alec in the plane mirror, right? We, we do end up seeing a virtual Alec, right? Because plane mirrors always form images that appear to be coming from behind the mirror. And the virtual Alec would be an equal distance behind the mirror as the real Alec is in front of it. Uh, the virtual Alec would be just as tall as the real Alec, and same orientation. Okay, so plane mirror, plane mirrors always form virtual erect images that have a magnification of one, right? No magnification at all. Uh, and then we went on to deal with curved mirrors, right? So we had concave mirrors and convex mirrors, right? There's concave. Here's convex if we're standing up on this side. And all of these curved mirrors had what we call a focal point as well as a center of curvature. The center of curvature kind of marks the spot that would be the center of a circle that would match the curve of the mirror. And then the focal point is uh, halfway between the center of curvature and the mirror. Um, we did do, well, we did do ray diagrams for mirrors. We just didn't do them quantitatively. Um, and I do think it's important to make sure that we remember how the rays work for our mirrors and our lenses. So you should have that in your notes, but let me just do a quick version of each one anyway. So for a concave mirror, we kind of had two different scenarios. We had one scenario for when our object was fairly far away from the mirror, uh, and we had two rays that we drew for all of these curved lenses and curved mirrors. We had ray one, which starts at the top of our object, travels parallel to the principal axis, and then reflects through the focal point. And then we have ray 2, which also starts at the top of the object, goes through the focal point on the way to the mirror, and then reflects so that it goes parallel to the principal axis. Remember, we do reflect stuff off of the principal plane, not off of the mirror surface itself. And then the image forms where those two reflected rays uh, intersect. So, sorry, that's kind of sloppy, but whatever. You have neater ones in your notes and in your textbook. Um, if the object is pretty far away from a concave mirror, we will always get a real image that is inverted. Sometimes it's bigger, sometimes it's smaller. It kind of depends if we're further away from the center of curvature or not. But we'll always get a real inverted image. If we are closer to the mirror than the focal point, we do have a, an entirely different outcome. So if here's the focal point, we have our object very close, then the rays are the same. Ray 1 still goes parallel to the principal axis and it still reflects through the focal point. Sorry, I missed a little bit. And then ray 2 was very difficult to figure out how it goes because we're supposed to go through the focal point on the way to the mirror, but we can't do that. So the way that we, we got around that, I think it was Holly that came up with it, was to start at the focal point 
go across the top of the object until we hit the principal plane, and then reflect parallel to the principal axis. And you might remember that those two reflected rays do not ever intersect, so we have to extend them to the virtual side of the mirror. And we always get an object that is uh, virtual and erect and larger than the object, right? Anytime the object is in between the focal point. Uh, we have convex mirrors as well, right? So for convex mirrors, the focal point is on the virtual side of the mirror. And we actually always get the same image properties when we use a convex mirror. This was like our shoplifting mirror. I think I still have my like backseat child mirror in the, in the back room that you can kind of look at. Uh, ray 1 still goes parallel to the principal axis. Ray 1 still reflects. It can't reflect through the focal point since the focal point's on the other side of the mirror. But this is where we kind of use the focal point to guide the geometry of that reflected ray. And then ray 2 aims towards the focal point on its way to the mirror and then reflects parallel to the principal axis. So again, we do have to extend those reflected rays back behind the mirror, and we should always get an erect, virtual, smaller image. The other thing I'll point out before we briefly review the equations is that for all of these diagrams, it is still the law of reflection that, that determines the outcomes. We're just using these two rays. Um, we're just using these rays to not have to get out of protractor and make sure that when the light hits the, the mirror, that we do have an angle of incidence and angle of reflection. Okay, then we did have our equations that also helped us out with these. So we had the one equation, and these are on the equation sheet, right? You have that for the, for the final exam. We have the one equation that we typically use to find the image distance, and then we have the other equation that we typically use to find the image height. I think I got that right. Let me just double check. This is one of the ones that never 100% confident that I get wrong. Uh, yeah, that's perfect. Alright, so I think when we actually did curved mirrors, the only uh, quantitative problems we solved, we used the equations for, <coughs> but then we did learn how to quantify the ray diagrams. I, I'm not having rulers at the exam for you, so you're not going to be required to do any problems with scale diagrams, but you might be asked to do sketches, or you might want to do sketches to answer like multiple choice questions or whatnot. Um, the only other thing I'll point out, and then I'll see if we have additional questions on chapter 17, is that remember, any time that the focal point is on the virtual side of the mirror, we do have to give it a negative position. Okay, so when we're using the equations, we have to give a negative value to the focal point for a convex mirror, for a concave mirror, it would always have a positive value. And if we're using the equations, right, and we get a negative image distance, you know, negative always means it's on the virtual side of the mirror. Um, other questions from you guys about chapter 17 and reflection? Great. So chapter 18 was on refraction of light. And just like the law of reflection was the entire basis of Chapter 17, Snell's Law was the entire basis for almost everything in Chapter 18. So Snell's Law relates the uh, angle of incidence and the angle of refraction, but we also have this index of refraction quantity that's embedded in there. And the index of refraction is defined as the ratio of the speed of light in a vacuum to the speed of light in whatever substance our light is traveling through. Okay? And what are the two values that are not on your equation sheet that I did expect you to know back in chapter 18? Or what are the two media? Air and vacuum. Right? So a vacuum, index of refraction of a vacuum would be C over C. That's just exactly one. And then air is 1.0003. Um, I don't I don't think you actually need to know that for your final exam. I'd be surprised if all of the other physics teachers um, make their students know that. But it is quite possible 
that on a multiple choice question, it wouldn't be given to you, but you could really just use like one. It's close enough to one, but it's not going to affect any answer that you have. All right, so that's Snell's law, and then that also kind of covers the speed of light, because we just addressed how you can find the speed of light in a material. You would just divide the speed of light in a vacuum by the index of refraction. You absolutely have to know the speed of light in a vacuum. You absolutely have to know 3.00 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. All right, and then the next piece, which really wasn't another topic, had to do with a special angle of incidence that can cause the refractive ray to not truly refract. Okay, so the critical angle of incidence only exists if this n is larger than this n, or it only exists if the index of refraction of the incident medium is greater than the index of refraction of the second medium. So the critical angle of incidence is that special angle of incidence that causes the refractive ray to be right along the boundary. And remember, we just use Snell's law to do that, and we would put in an angle of refraction of exactly 90 degrees, right? That allows us to solve for the critical angle. And then if we go a little bit greater than the critical angle, we no longer use Snell's law to govern the behavior. We use the law of reflection to govern the behavior, and, and um, we call that total internal reflection. Uh, then we did uh, have, I don't know, a 15 minute discussion on mirages. I don't know that there's much we need to know beyond, uh, about mirages beyond that it's a, a phenomenon involving refraction. Um, and then we did spend, I don't know, 40 minutes, 20 minutes on dispersion, which is, uh, dispersion is a word for acknowledging that different frequencies of light do not actually travel at the same speed through dense media. Through a vacuum, everybody travels at exactly the same speed. And in air, not enough of a difference to notice, but in things like water, glass, diamonds, the different frequencies do travel at different speeds. Uh, and then we did talk about rainbows, and rainbows utilized a bunch of just different stuff, right? Dispersion was a key part of uh, these water droplets separating, it, separating out different colors. Uh, total internal refra reflection was a huge part. Uh, Snell's law was a huge part. All of these things uh, were involved with rainbow formation. Uh, then we went ahead and applied refraction to our curved lenses. Right? We did our ray diagrams again. We did our equations again. So let's briefly review how to do those. Um, I think we spent more time with double convex lenses. So one of the differences between lenses and, and curved lenses and curved mirrors is that if we're using double lenses, both sides do have a focal point, right? And this side has a focal point back here, and then this side has a focal point over here. Uh, and we did our ray diagrams. I suppose I need to sketch on the principal plane as well. Uh, so for double convex, we do get two different types of images. We get one type, again, if our object is very far away from the lens in relation to the focal point. And ray one, just like before, goes parallel to the principal axis, and then through the front side's focal point. Ray two goes, um, ray two goes through the back side's focal point, this one, on the way to the lens, and then refracts so that it goes parallel to the principal axis. So the two refracted rays intersect here. That's where our image forms. And remember, we expect the image to be on the opposite side of the lens from the object. So this is a real image. It is in, it's so sloppy, sorry. This one points way down, it should be parallel. Uh, it's, it's real, it's inverted, and it kind of depends on, on exactly how far away we are, on if it's bigger or smaller. Uh, we had another type of image that we could form with the double convex lens, and that's if we were very close to the lens, like closer than the focal point. So ray one still goes parallel to the principal axis, and it still uses the front side's focal point, which is over here. So if 
for Ray 1, there's actually really no difference from our, our other situation. For Ray 2, right, the, the ray is supposed to go through the backside floating point on the way to the lens. So we need to use that same trick that we saw with, with uh, curved mirrors. And then that ray will refract so that it goes parallel to the principal axis. So these two refracted rays do not intersect. So we have to extend them to the virtual side of the lens. All right, so we do get a virtual image. It is erect, and it will always be larger than the object. Uh, we also had concave lenses. Highly recommend that you can do these ray diagrams. Okay, focal point here, focal point here. Uh, for a double concave lens, it really makes no difference where the object is located. We get the same image properties regardless. Uh, ray 1 goes parallel to the principal axis, and then it refracts through the front side's focal point. Front side's focal point is this one. Now, we can't truly refract and go through the focal point. That would be reflecting. So we use this focal point as a guide for that refracted ray. Similarly, ray 2 uses the backside's focal point, which is this one. And we will aim, that was bad. We will aim ray 2, that's uh, pretty bad too, um, at that focal point, and then refract parallel to the principal axis. Those two refracted rays do not intersect, so I have, to I have to extend them to the virtual side of the lens, and I do get a virtual erect but smaller image than the object that I started with. In terms of the equations, they're the same equations as for mirrors. However, it is the front side's focal point that determines whether the value that we use in the equations is positive or negative, okay? So it is the concave lens whose focal point is on the virtual side. So a concave lens will get a negative focal point, whereas a convex lens will always get a positive focal point. So it's actually the opposite. Well, in terms of positive and negative, it's the opposite of curved mirror. And then we spent not that long, maybe 20 minutes, talking about the, the eye and how the eye forms images. So remember, we do need a, a nice focused image to be on our retina, because our retina is where the light-sensitive cells are that can communicate to our brain. Um, and there are two main eye parts that do refracting, right? The cornea and then the lens itself, which is internal to the eye. And it's the cornea that, that actually does more of the refracting than the, uh, than the lens. All right. Any other questions about chapter uh, 18 stuff? Yes. Are there diagrams when you're solving the equations for like the homework and the test you study with people in San Diego? Can you study that? Can you do what? People in San Diego, or do you want to see that? Yes. Um, yeah, it's fine with me as long as the question doesn't specifically ask for something else. Um, yeah, that's fine with me. Uh, and on multiple choice, obviously, you know, whatever the answer choices are. Uh, anything else? Okay. So we do have um, about 15 minutes, uh, which is great. Um, we invite, I'm not going to rush, because we still have another meeting. Um, we have one meeting or two meetings before finals? Definitely one, maybe two. I, I don't have in my head yet which classes we see which days. But whatever, um, 15 minutes, I mean, we're, we're going to be doing review next class, but if we need to do five minutes of, to, to tidy up, that's absolutely fine. Uh, so I do want to talk a little bit more specifically about electricity as it applies to like our houses and like the school, um, not so much like batteries and resistors and light bulbs. Um, so first of all, who, who's, who's this? Very good. Very good. It's, it's a circuit breaker. Sometimes people say fuse box, but that's wrong. It actually is a circuit breaker. Fuse box is something different. And you have this in your house somewhere, right? Uh, and there's only a few places where we typically find them. Where do we typically find them? Basement is one. Garage is pretty common also. Those are the two most common places. Sometimes there's like a little dedicated like, closet um, if you don't have a basement typically. 
Um, I, when I wired my house, I put one in the basement, but I actually put the second one in a little tiny closet upstairs. Uh, so I have two, um, but whatever. So, so we're going to talk more about that uh, later on. But I want to revisit this question of are things in parallel or are they in series? And I think we, you all seem to know that the stuff in your house was in parallel. Um, might not be so obvious for overhead lights that some of you talked about, but when you plug something into an outlet, I mean, it's supposed to get 120 volts. Like, that's what it's designed to get. If we had it in series with other things, the manufacturer would have no idea what potential difference it, it, it would, would be getting, and then they'd be unable to make like a single pencil sharpener that could work for everyone. Right? So when we plug things in, every outlet does get 120 volts. So that's extremely strong evidence that things in your house are connected in parallel. But that's actually not the entire story. Um, have any of you ever experienced that, like, you blew a circuit and somebody had to go down and reset this? Like maybe the power to an entire room or something like that? Only Jane and Holly, that's it? So we are a bunch of them. Um, can any of you give us more information about like what you did or what somebody else did that actually set it off? Yeah? I like you're using too much power to so the thing in the circuit right there. Well, fine, but what like what in particular? Yeah, Jane. You were both using a hair drop, okay? Anybody else have direct experience and you can tell us how? Like a window unit? Yeah. Yeah, air conditioner, right? Absolutely. And then, so when you used, when you were both used your hair dryers, did any, Jane, did anything else go out besides the two hair dryers? Like any lights or anything? Yeah. Like the whole house or a couple of rooms or what? Um, the whole house. The whole house, ooh, okay. Probably not. Um, Alec, when you did your air conditioner, did, it, did anything else go out that you noticed? Yeah, the lights. In the whole house? In the room, all right. So that's actually some evidence that must not be entirely parallel, right? If you do something to one thing and it affects other things, <laughs> that's kind of reminiscent of series circuits. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, well, that that's a little bit more complicated, but I, I'm happy to address that. That'll probably have to be next time. Yeah. So the question was, well, wait a second. Sometimes when the microwave turns on, or when I dry my hair, or when the air conditioner kicks on, the lights dim a little bit. That happens in here sometimes. And when it happens in here, we usually hear a noise outside the window right before it happens. Pay attention to it. The only problem is we don't usually hear noises because the fans are so loud this year. But the lights in here do dim. And I usually hear a loud noise outside. Whatever. Please remind me next time because we're not going to get to that today. I, I want to... So what is the point of this thing? It's annoying to have to go down in the basement and like fix it if you and your mom blow dry your hair at the same time. So Henry, what the heck is the point? Well, it's like to stop like, bad things from happening. Power, like if you generate too much current and power then What's the problem with generating too much current? Alright, so, so actually we don't know enough yet to, to answer that. I want to draw a circuit diagram that we might have in our house. Now, uh, I'm not going to use the symbol for a battery, I'm going to use the symbol for a generator because it's just not, I mean, we don't power our houses with batteries, we don't really do with generators either. But I'm just going to use the symbol for a generator. Um, and the circuit breaker is really just a fancy switch. Right? The symbol for a switch is two dots with a line, and the line is up if the switch is open, and the line is down if the switch is closed. So if our circuit is, is live, then the switch would be closed. Again, this little black switch on the circuit breaker is this switch. And then let's have um, James' hair dryer right on our circuit. Let's have James' mom's hair dryer on the circuit. And she said there were some lights also. Any guesses? Anybody know how powerful a hair dryer is, like in watts? We're talking about 100 watt bulbs, 60 watt bulbs. Any guesses how powerful a hair dryer is? What carrot? 120? 30. You guys are nowhere close. Uh, this is really, this is, this is very hard to, to read. Right there. 
1875 watts. It's so powerful. I mean, it's essentially a toaster oven that has a fan. I mean, a toaster oven is so much current going through the little bare wires that they glow red, right, and give off lots of heat. This is the same thing inside here with a fan. So yes, 1875 watts. And maybe a couple of hundred watt holes as well. Is there anybody in here that to two significant digits could tell me how much current goes through this hair dryer when it's on? I would hope everybody can if I gave you enough time. But let's let the quick people tell us. It's big, Victoria, right? What is it? 15 amperes? Okay, whatever 1875 divided by 120 is, and that's the answer. 15 amperes. Whatever. Let's just say 15. Um, 15 amperes. How many amperes for this? Like one, right? Yeah, let's just say one. Okay. So how much total current is in this circuit? 32, right? So we have 32 amperes going through the common parts of this circuit, which would be, I should use a different color. I mean, there's only one ampere going through these wires. There's, there's one ampere going through these wires. There's actually two amperes going through this wire here, right? Because the current has to get delivered to both parts. But the parts of the circuit that really have a lot of current would be here and here. And that would be 32 amperes. That is a tremendous amount of current. These circuit breakers are designed to open the switch if the current exceeds a certain value. And the common values are like 10 amperes, 15 amperes, and like 25 amperes. You can do more, but 25 is the highest common uh, current that would cause these to open up. So if Jane and her mom do their hair dryers at the same time, that's 30 amperes, obviously those two outlets are on a breaker that's designed to open at 25 amperes or small. What's the problem with, with having 32 amperes? We don't have 32 amperes going through a hair dryer or a light bulb. We only have 32 amperes going through a wire. What's the problem with that? Yeah. The wires can be powerful. We talked about wires being powerful. 32 amperes, even with a small resistance, right, which will have a small voltage drop, can be quite powerful, and they can burn. Right? It's an electrical fire. And you have so much current going through the wires that they melt their insulation off, and that insulation can catch on fire, or it can catch things next to it on fire. So the circuit breaker will open up if more current than the designated amount goes through. Questions about that? Yeah. Uh, Question about the hair dryer? No, not the circuit breaker. The circuit breaker, okay? It opens, and all you have to do is walk down there and turn the switch the other way. Almost exactly. It, 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 it's, a, it's not exactly the same, almost the same as one of these switches. You don't have to replace anything. And that's why we use circuit breakers now and not fuse boxes. So probably maybe in the 1960s um, were when this type of circuit breaker became common. Prior to that, people had fuse boxes, and a fuse is something that melts when too much current goes through. I have some, I'll pass it around. Um, and then you have to replace it, right? So if you have spares, no big deal. You just put the spare in the circuit breaker, but most people don't keep lots of spares. I'm just going to pass these around. So this is the type of fuse that, that goes into fuse boxes. Um, my house is very old, like over 200 years old. Um, I do have a circuit breaker, but in my crawl space, I've, I don't think I've brought any in. In my crawl space, so look at it and just pass it back. You'll see a little piece of metal inside that melts if, if too much current goes through. In my crawl space, I've found like burned out fuses because whoever replaced it was just lazy and threw it in the crawl space. I have an unattached garage, which apparently hasn't been rewired since the 60s, and I still have a fuse box in there. Um, other questions about that specifically, and I have a little 